important. Okay, so Mark, I'm sure most of you will have attended the, his talks in this series already, but just in case it's somebody that you don't already know about, for most people, he doesn't need any introduction, but just to kind of let you know a little bit about him, is somebody you haven't kind of come across before. He's a really renowned botanist. He's our, we're very, very lucky to have him at the LNHS as our vascular plant recorder. He's also the BSBI county recorder for Middlesex. He's an author. He's done a lot of work on forensic botany. He's currently doing quite a lot of work helping police with various sorts of inquiries so that, that, that's a you know really interesting aspect of his work and he's also a very popular speaker and we're delighted to have him here this evening so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand you over to Mark. Thank you very much Maria and I will get rid of yours and start mine. Yep. Yeah. Nice, so, yeah, we're yeah, yeah. So I just like I've got my old computer this evening, and it's somewhat slow to react at times. That, that's perfect. Thank <laughs> you. First off, can't believe how much botany is in this this time. That's very good. Um, uh, for new members, please do join us and get this excellent work because it's very good fun with lots of lovely pieces of interesting botany and natural history written in there. Uh, the next thing I wanted to say was I'm terribly sorry about having to uh, cancel the last uh, session on uh, rivers and aquatic habitats. Um, as Maria alluded to, that was because of my crime scene work. I was actually at a murder investigation and uh, I was unable to attend to do this. So this is the last in this series um, and it's a bit of a sweepings um, of different habitats and the most profoundly impacted urban habitats of our um, city um, and it's fair to say um, have um, attributes which are in common with cities globally um, streets railways and brownfield sites um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term brownfield um, it's a language which is I, I think peculiarly um, British. This term refers to primarily to formerly urban industrial landscapes that have fallen into disuse, um, have to varying degrees been cleared and have seeded themselves quite literally to wildlife. And brownfield habitats are some of the most fascinating and frankly species rich habitats in urban environments all around the world and certainly in London. Sadly in the London area over the last 20 or so years we have gone through very very intensive redevelopment of parts of our city that were once from a humanity perspective forlorn and neglected um, but these sites have now been brought back into human use areas such as the Greenwich Peninsula, the Lower River Lee, the King's Cross area for example in particular but many other areas which once upon a time supported diverse brownfield habitat have now sadly largely been lost. Um, and this is really, really unfortunate from an urban biodiversity point of view, because as I say, brownfield sites are incredibly species rich. And in my early days of a professional field botanist and surveyor in the London area, I once visited a site in South East London, and I have never counted so many plant species on one site in my life. Even to this day, I ticked about 200 species within about an hour and a half. I could barely keep up with the diversity of plant communities and also the associated invertebrate and other habitats that are there. So brownfield sites are extraordinarily important for plants. And they are also of immense value and importance for invertebrate and other organism groups as well. So uh, let us proceed. Um, once more, just to remind you, this is the area that the LNHS encompass. This is this large circle around here. This is um, often referred to as the polygon when it is used in a mapping format because of the mapping grid squares of the UK. And you'll notice embedded within there is the current area of modern Greater London in red. The historic bit of London is this little snip in the middle. 
um, and we have the adjoining counties or vice counties of South East England. And my relatively small vice county of Middlesex is over much of North and West London with a little bit out here in modern day Surrey because they nicked a bit of my county. Um, the reason I have this up because this explains some of the diversity and complexity of recording in a city where different organisations such as the London Natural History Society, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland is active. And we endeavour to send our records to our local biological records centre, Giggle, as well as to the national scheme of BSBI. So it is quite a complicated recording and observing environment as well as an urban environment. Um, now, the London Natural History Society, for those of you who are not familiar with it, has a deep set history um, right into the mid 19th century, pretty much. Um, but I'm going to focus momentarily upon one of the society's most interesting and actually important and with great foresight activities. And this was the floor of the London bomb, bomb sites in the 90, late 1940s and early 50s. Um, obviously, World War II had a massive and very significant impact upon populations and societies worldwide. And London, like many other cities in Europe, was very, very heavily affected by bombing and the impacts of war. Much of the historic city, the Docklands and other parts of the city were very, very severely damaged or destroyed. And this is one of the views of this area, not far from the historic London Wall and the Roman Wall of London. <coughs> this area has now been developed and essentially is the modern Barbican Centre, at least in part. And the society was uh, incredibly innovative because it took an early uh, lead in recognising the diversity and value of these former built environments. This will be definitely called a brownfield site today uh, and recognising not only the species richness in terms of the plant communities and vertebrates, but also actually the great significant value in understanding the processes of succession, the early stages after the bombing, how plant communities changed and shifted very rapidly. This plant specimen on the right hand side is part of one of the collections from this activity. It currently resides at the Natural History Museum in London and it is of a <coughs> excuse me, Rose Bay, <coughs> terribly sorry, I've got the tail end of the cold, Rose Bay Willow Herb. And Rose Bay Willow Herb was one of the great winners of uh, World War II in that it was able to exploit a landscape that became open and fitted its ecology. Principally, this is a plant in the natural world of montane river, river gravel, scree and cliff habitats where it could live and survive in rubble and types of environment, gravel, etc. And this um, new habitat, along with the railways, was of great um, advantage to it and it moved in with a plum. So Rose Bay Willow Herb was one of many plants um, that thrived in this environment. It's also called in some communities fireweed, potentially associated with the bombing vents, but also from its very, very vivid pinky red colouring. Now, <clears throat> brownfield and urban and streets and railways come and all the associated habitats come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. Railways in the Greater London area are immensely important for biodiversity. Um, as you can imagine, they are very, very challenging to record because of the health and safety restrictions of being able to gain access. So in many cases, us natural historians have to peer over railway bridges with binoculars, etc., etc., and peer at things from afar to work out what is actually thriving here. Yeah. But railways remain, despite some shifts in management and impacts of weed killer in places and the impact of invasive species, which I'll come to in a while, 
remain incredibly important diverse matrix habitats for our wildlife. Unfortunately, many of London's canals have suffered quite greatly within the last 20 years, and they have been embraced by society, particularly in the era of COVID, as important public space. But as a consequence, they have been tidied almost into oblivion. So areas that were once very species rich and habitat diverse for canal sites and part of this, these brown field and sort of semi post industrial landscapes of Kings Cross area are now sadly greatly diminished because of the urge to tidy and primp and make pretty. Now, uh, defining, you know, streets, brown fields and urban environments has a sort of bit of a sliding wall logic to it, because this plant here is a rather unusual and extraordinary record. This is Chinese gooseberry. Uh, and this uh, plant was actually pointed out to me by the uh, well-known and very greatly respected and much loved local botanist and natural historian, David Bevan in North London. Um, and it's actually growing in a woodland, but it's sort of quasi brown field. And because it was growing in an area where part of a sewer had cracked, was damaged, and nasty things were leaking out a little bit. Um, and Chinese gooseberry and tomatoes and other plants associated with the human diet were growing in this space. To this day, I think this is the only record of a wild Chinese gooseberry in the London area. Um, I also wanted to, before I delve into some more details and some aspects of this talk, is actually unpick some language which is sometimes very confusing. And these are scientific or way names and phrases that we use as native, non-native and invasive. Um, and this is very important piece because an um, issue because, and I'll start that sentence again, this is a very important issue because understanding what the scientific community means when we use this language is fundamental in terms of how we acknowledge and create a bridge with the rest of society and understanding sometimes how language use is somewhat different. Um, so in the case of native we are when we're talking from a science perspective about plants or animals we are talking about an organism that has arrived in a new piece of landscape whatever the time period it could be last week or a hundred thousand years ago through natural non-human mediated processes um, and therefore this would be things like for example after the last series of ice ages Mediterranean species moving north and colonizing south and west Britain, such as this particular plant, Umbilicus rupestris, the navel word. This is a widespread native plant across much of Western Britain and Ireland. It is uncommon in the east of England because this is a plant that pre prefers moisture and it also prefers, certainly in winter anyway, can tolerate great degree levels of drought in summer. Um, not a lot of cold and therefore is very much restricted in central and eastern England in its distribution. So, for example, in central England, the furthest east it gets is more or less the middle of Northamptonshire. This is a plant which has historically been very, very uncommon in the Greater London area, but over the last 20 years or so has gradually become more frequent and its seed seems to be able to disperse in the wind quite long distance. Populations pop up on walls almost out of nowhere. And bit by bit, this is a plant which is gradually becoming more frequent in, very, uh, in various parts of London. This is partly, almost certainly, in reflection of um, climate change as well, which I will be talking about a lot as we proceed. So, we have native and we have non-native. And by non-native, we mean an organism that is in a piece of landscape or environment through and directly through the activity or agency of humanity, such as this plant here, the Cretan brake fern. This is a popular house plant and has been grown in Britain's houses for a good two or three hundred years, probably. 
This plant has almost certainly arrived in this particular location by uh, somebody having a pot plant of this on their windowsill. The window has been left open and spores blown from the parent plant onto this crack on this piece of metalwork on the edge of a rail work and this new wild population has started. Now the important thing I also want to address about the idea of native versus non-native is the fact that these are not value judgments. There's no inferment of good or bad. It's not natives good, non-natives bad. It's a matter of process and it's also not a matter of how long. As I say, a native could have very recently established in the last few years through its own independent humanity activities, or you could have a non-native that has been around for a very, very long time. And non-native species that we refer to as being in the environment for a very long time are referred to as archaeophytes, which I'll come to in a moment. This delightful plant here is a neophyte because it has a recent origin as a wild plant in Britain Island. I think actually the earliest record for this species is only probably about 60 years ago or so. Generally speaking, we have a somewhat arbitrary cutoff date of 1500. Um, which I possibly could debate and discuss with you later on. So we have native and non-native, we have archaeophytes and neophytes. And the diversity of archaeophytes in our environment, <coughs> I just noticed a bone flake, will um, surprise you because many plants which we find growing in our landscape um, and are very abundant across much of Northern Europe are actually not native, they are archaeophytes. They have been with us in many cases for thousands of years in Northern Europe. Such plants as common mallow, this lovely pink thing in the back, and the wonderful mugwort here in the front right hand corner. These are plants of essentially Mediterranean environment origin that moved into Northern Europe, Britain and Ireland through the activities of our ancestors, Neolithic farmers, as agricultural weeds, etc. Hoary mustard, on the other hand, this fantastic nipper of cabbage family, which is incredibly valuable for a wide range of invertebrates in the London area, is a recent introduction. It is a neophyte. And this is an indication of how rapid the spread of this neophytic plant has been. The map on the right hand side was produced in my predecessors, um, Rodney Burton's Flora, published in 1983. And you can see at this date that this, this species had a limited and rather scattered distribution through the London area. Come to the current era, this is up to about 2020, um, you can now see that this plant is very widespread and in many cases is very, very abundant across much of London and in fact is rapidly spreading into other parts of Britain. I just saw it in Sunderland a few days ago. So this is a non-native Mediterranean species that is moving very, very rapidly in our urban environments and is found on roadsides, canal sides, brownfield sites, railways, etc, etc. It is tolerant of a great range of habitats. Now, the challenging word is invasive. Invasiveness does infer badness, so to speak. And my old friend, Budlia Davidii, Budlia, um, is probably the most important terrestrial invasive plant in many parts of lowland Britain and Ireland. <coughs> this species has only been growing wild, as far as we know, in Britain since the 1920s. This herbarium specimen from the Natural History Museum was collected in West London, usually in, I think, 1927. So in less than 100 years, this plant has gone from being a rather unusual esoteric garden escape to one of the most dominant plants in many urban and suburban and increasingly rural habitats across our environment. As you can see from here, a mere 14,000 records for this species in the London area to date. And invasiveness is a process which is continuing 
with great speed at the moment. As our climate change and our environment becomes more disrupted, this creates space ecologically an adaptive advantage for many invasive species. This is a topic that is very close to my hand, heart, because these invasive species tend to start off in these kind of habitats that we talk about the street corner, the railway side, et cetera, et cetera. And Tree of Heaven is no exception. This plant has been grown in gardens for about 270 years. And over the last 50, 20 or so years, it has shown its invasive teeth in parts of the London area um, and is increasingly spreading and is in many places out competing Budlia. And once more, to give you an indication of how significant that shift has been, here are the uncommon records from the 1970s up to the 1980s. In fact, many of these dots may well actually be planted trees as well, individuals. Over here, we have the probably already out of date and under recorded distribution of this plant in the London area. Um, and it is uh, going to have a very, very significant negative impacts, not only on human well-being, because it has allergenic properties, but also on things like the built environment, it damages railway infrastructure, for example, Network Rail are very, very concerned about this species. Um, but it is also going to have a very negative impact upon these rich plant communities of native and non-native plant species we have in our city that are not going to be able to compete with this plant. Oop. And then we have the potentially invasive chasing along behind um, is the rather delightful foxglove tree, Paulonia tomentosa. This very beautiful plant is much beloved by gardeners. But again, as climate change shifts, we are seeing this species regenerate, produce seedlings on street corners. And um, this is just around the corner from my house um, and has not yet established as such in a habitat, unlike Tree of Heaven or Budlia, but it will do in a few years. It is probably under recorded because this young seedling here um, exemplifies the fact that it is often mistaken for young plants of this street side denizen, Gallinsoga quadrivadiata. Apologies for the poor quality of the image. I just have to grab it really quickly from my archives and didn't do a good job. Um, this <coughs> is a member of the daisy family. It hails from South America. It was accidentally introduced into the wild in Britain, courtesy of Kew Gardens, where it was grown as a horticultural and botanical novelty in the flower beds there. It has skipped over the wall and has now become very widespread in the warmer habitats and street corners of the London area. Um, and I'm one or two slides here, as you may recall, that probably um, I'll most definitely repeat. Unfortunately, as I say, I've been rather busy of late. But those of you who joined me on the um, LNHS Botany Walk in uh, Limehouse, you may recall I was getting very excited about rue leaved saxifrage. This is a plant species which 20 years ago was on the brink of extinction. It was restricted to ancient walls and old pieces of landscape in our city for some unfathomable or with some guess that it may be to do with weed killer resistance reasons this species has changed its ecology extraordinarily and has adapted to railway sidings street corners um, canal walls you name it very very rapidly and can sometimes be found by the million pretty much this is a species which as they say was on the brink of extinction a few years ago in the london area unlike its uh, rather like the relative granulata which is heading down the plug hole now <clears throat> Native species from other parts of Britain are colonizing our city. I mentioned earlier on um, navel wort. Here are two other southwesterly plant species which have embraced London's street corners and old buildings and walls. These are sea spleen wort and lanceolate spleen wort, both of which have currently two or three known locations in the warm inner 
part of Greater London on old building walls. Both of them are currently still very, very uncommon. In particular, seam spleen wort is very, very vulnerable to frost um, um, and actually also requires a little bit of salt in its diet because it is very much a coastal species. But again, these plants strongly indicate the rapidly changing environment we have on our urban, excuse me, <coughs> in our cities and ultimately in our wider landscape. Other widespread and very important non-native assemblages on our walls that adorn and give great beauty are two plants with somewhat notoriously unpronounceable names for us anglophones. These are Campanula posha skyana and the Adria bellflower Campanula portenschlagayana, both of which hail from the uh, central parts of the uh, northern Balkans, central parts of the Balkans, uh, in part of the former Yugoslavia. I cannot remember which country off the top of my head. I have a feeling it is Croatia. Um, Poshar Skyana in particular is quite a scarce plant in the wild. It is exuberant and very, very abundant in parts of London streets. Curiously, both species, whilst they seem to provide exactly the same habitat, they don't that often grow cheek by jowl. And this seems to be a pattern that I see time and time again in many towns and cities across Britain and Ireland. Both species can be quite abundant in, <coughs> in the city, but they tend to favour slightly different parts of town. So this shot of the two of them next to each other is relatively infrequent. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. Another non native plant which has rapidly increased in abundance is the delightful Mexican fleabane, Erigeron carvinskianus. This is a species which 40 years ago, when I was in my teens, you had to go to southwest England to Cornwall to see it growing on the walls as a non native plant in coastal areas. <coughs> Apologies. Um, it has now rapidly colonised urban areas across much of um, England and Wales and parts of Scotland and Ireland. It is a warmth lover, but the shift in climate has been sufficient. This plant is able to colonise new wall habitats. There are some current concerns that this species may threaten the viability of some of the wall loving ferns that we have in our cities because it is very, very robust when it gets going. Another thing about cities is it throws plants into juxtaposition in ways that you will not normally get. Um, plants that are growing in gardens will sometimes be, end up being right next to relatives that they wouldn't normally see in the wild. And here we have an example. This is another member of the daisy family, Jacobaea albescens, this plant growing here in the middle. This plant here was growing on a piece of derelict brownfield site land in part of West London. It turns up every now and then. And it is the hybrid between our native Jacobaea vulgaris um, and the dusty miller silvery leaved relative Jacobaea cinerea which is a plant of coastal cliffs of the Mediterranean region. And when the two meet under unusual circumstances on our street corners, they produce this hybrid albescence, which is intermediate in color of leaf in leaf form, etc. And hybridization in cities, um, as I know to come through some extraordinary rarities. On the left is common mallow, this is this widespread archaeophytic ancient introduction that I referred to earlier on. Um, so familiar that people tend to assume that it's a native plant and it's not. Next to it is the extraordinary rare hybrid Malva discipiens, which I found growing on a piece of brownfield site in West in central London. This is the one and only record of this hybrid that I know of to date in this country, which is one of the very, very few records of this plant in the world, and it's a hybrid between common mallow and another non-native mallow species. 
Hey, sorry about the police siren in the background, if you can hear that. That's the joys of living in East Lipton for you. Be hopefully gone in a moment. I'm going to close the window. Of course, as I turn the, close the window, he turns the siren off. Um, I'm now going to talk about the impact of horticultural introductions. This is a very important aspect of how non-native species are establishing on our street corners and city areas. Cabbage tree cordelini from the southern hemisphere from New Zealand has become locally frequent as a street corner hanger out as has passion flower. There's an absolutely fantastic brownfield site in southeast London where this plant vies for control with a Russian vine and a Virginia creeper um, to make quite a thicket. Now, alongside these purposefully introduced plants, we are finding many, many Mediterranean environment species creeping in under the radar and um, such plants as Mediterranean nettle urtica membranacea, common cudweed and this delightful white ramping fumitory fumaria capriolata. Just to surprise you a little bit, the fumaria is in fact a rather funny poppy. It is a member of the poppy family. Now, the, all of these plants are what we refer to as wintergreen annuals of the Mediterranean environment. They are adapted to growing a seed through the winter months in the damp Mediterranean environment, flowering rapidly in spring and early summer, and then going to ground through the heat of the Mediterranean summer. And many of these species have colonized or recolonized, as in the case of common cudweed, parts of urban lowland Britain in the last few years. Um, Mediterranean nettle has a delightful tendency to be associated with some of the more rancid street corners of central London. Um, it is particularly fond of living in corners where pigeons go to the loo and drunk people. Um, it is a nitrophile and he likes the extra food. Um, but we are finding the common cudweed, a once scare plant, scarce plant, is increasing in abundance and is being introduced through these large container grown plants that have been introduced from the Mediterranean. So there's a whole cohort of Mediterranean annuals, another one being this delightful mossy little thing. This is Polycarpon tetraphyllum, the four-leaved all seed. This you have probably walked past dozens of times if you're a London urbanite, but it's also, I found it in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. This is a species which 30 years ago was a Mediterranean basin plant. The, felt the, the opportunity for seeing it in Britain was very much restricted to a tiny part of West Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. But this plant is a relative of carnation, has quietly escaped the flower bed in these pots that I referred to, and has moved into our street corners. Oops, not me. Ah, going the wrong way. Can't remember how to use my mouse. Apologies. Oh, I'm going really going the wrong way. Get that right way. Apologies, going daft. There we go. Ah, nearly there. Utterly bonkers. There we go. This is actually a relative of the carnation. Another species which I've waxed lyrical about over the years is early meadow grass, Poa infirma, which has shown one of the most extraordinary range expansions onto street corners and parts of London. Uh, I just thought I'd show you momentarily the difference between this and its very close relative, Poa annua. On the left here in this patch of grass is Poa annua, and on the right is early meadow grass, Poa infirma. It, because you can see it has a rather sickly yellow colour, which makes it look like from a distance, whether it's been weed on by a dog or something. Now, the impacts of London's history are incredibly important in the diversity of our flora. The Great Fire of London created one of the largest expenses of what we now refer to as Brownfield site. And this plant, London Rocket, thrived in that landscape over the next few years until the city was rebuilt. Um, <coughs> it then petered out as the environment shifted and the city became more solid and less open space available for it. 
but in the last 20 years or so, it has gone through a renaissance, partially probably through um, shifts in climate again, and also potentially introductions from these horticultural sources of Mediterranean and Italian grown plants. And it comes in two colour forms in London. This chromy yellow variant tends to be associated with the old city of London. This is in fact a little bit of Roman brickwork just behind it, or stonework rather. This variant here appears to be the more recent introduction that I find in Islington and the younger bits of the city. So we have two forms of this plant probably reflecting the diverse origins of this species in this city. So we're finding certain species are rebounding, others continue to struggle. Tower mustard is now an incredibly rare plant over much of Britain um, and is really struggling to survive. We have one small population surviving on a reservoir um, to the west of the city. And um, although very good news, um, just recently in southeast London, a new population was discovered um, on some ground that was overturned and exposing seed that was in the soil. So some of these species are not doing quite so well these days. Now everybody loves an orchid and this slide has been up two or three times over the last few years when I talk about orchids, but orchids are incredibly adaptable plants. So each one of these species we tend to associate with chalk grassland habitats, species rich habitats, wonderful hay meadows. But all three of these plants along with one or two others have found new landscape to in, and become in, um, surviving in the London area. They're often now found on brownfield habitats, those that are still left, and increasingly, particularly in the case of green winged orchid, on these uh, green roofs that have become popular of late. <laughs> now I'm just going to show you this um, because this is an image from a place which is one of the most celebrated brownfield sites in southeast England. This is from Canby Island, so just outside of Greater London. And this applied site exemplifies the extraordinary richness of mixed communities of diverse habitats and non-native and native species. Rose Campion is an old horticultural introduction, but this site supports an extraordinary diversity of invertebrates and after much fighting was saved from development, or part of it was at least. Now many brownfield sites um, have had things done to them, they've been tinkered with and various government agencies and departments love to throw around a little bit of wildflower seed mix. And this particular plant is not very well depicted in this image, is brown knapweed lurking in here. This is a non-native knapweed from Southern Europe. I just wanted to put this image up here just to show people how you identify different types of knapweed. You have to look at these wonderful scales, look at their combs and how they're divided in their proportions to help understand these different species. But in this particular location alongside uh, brown knapweed, we also have, as far as I know, the only known location, one of two rather apologies, for Gallium verum subspecies vertigenii. This is growing in hard core and rubble on the edge of the River Thames in East London. Um, and it has got here, it's a continental European species, primarily from Eastern Europe, or subspecies rather, has got into our city through the activities of seed mix presenters. And we also find wonderful and glamorous plants such as this. This is the I gave it the name Carthusian pink when I first found it. Um, I soon realized that it was way too big for the Carthusian pink, which is Dianthus Carthusianorum. I believe this is probably Dianthus giganteum from Spain, um, although I've not had a chance to actually identify it. So at the moment, it's nicknamed the pseudo Carthusian pink. And once more, it is found in a few places of these brownfield sites, courtesy of purposeful activities. Now, certain plant families seem to be better at adapting to um, urban environments than others, and the tomato family is no exception. Here we have uh, kangaroo apple, Solanum laciniatum, and tall nightshade, Solanum chiapodioides. 
both of which have got very different sort of aspects in their distribution. Solanum laciniatum is quite a middle class plant. It tends to hang out on nice street corners in Islington um, and other posher bits of Greater London, quite often in street corners of Kensington and Chelsea as well. Whereas tall nightshade, Solanum chenopodioides, is much more a plant of East London, Hackney, Barking and Dagenham, etc., and is often found growing not far from rivers and canals. Now, some of you may recall the walk we did in East London a few weeks ago, and I was trying to find this plant, Mexican tea, Dysphania ambrosioides, formerly Chenopodium ambrosioides. Um, it's a rather drab looking member of the Chenopod family with a rather extraordinary scent. And for those of you who were frustrated by us not being able to see it, here it is. If you see something like this, give it a rub. It's got quite a strong scent and let me know. We don't really know how this plant has become established in parts of East London. It has curiously quite a similar distribution to that of Solanum chenopodioides. More recent incomers into our city, because both of these other plants seem to have been in London for a long time, are plants such as this, Senecio inequidans. This is a species which was very, very rare, um, became started to colonise East London, North Kent marshes about 30 years ago, and is now very, very rapidly colonising parts of our city, particularly <coughs> in the east, but it is moving rapidly west. Superficially looks like Oxford ragwort, but it has long, narrow, almost grass-like leaves. Now, this plant is kind of just here momentarily to talk about, you know, even though we've, I've extolled the joys of non-native urban plants, but we have to be careful because this plant, Johnson grass sorghum halopensi, which we now have in two sites in London, is one of the world's most severe invasive species. Um, the literature indicates it should not be able to grow in our city. Allegedly, it's too cold here. Johnson grass does not seem to take any notice. Um, and this is a plant which can have very, very negative impacts upon grasslands in warm temperate regions and also on agricultural systems. So we are or have done when we had the resources made efforts to control this species in the London area. Sadly, we're in such a dire financial situation now, no control measures are in place. And just to emphasize this idea of shift and change, which I've picked upon, this plant here, Polypogon viridi, naughty may I've got a picture of it, um, is often was described as the plant with the most rapid range expansion and change in Britain and Ireland over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, it is now a very, very widespread plant across the urban parts of London air, of the Greater London. And once more, this is probably an underemphasis. And if you look at the data here on the right hand side, you'll see that this was a really, really scarce plant in both Britain and London for up until very, very recently. And then all of a sudden, around just in the early mid 2000s, the population exploded. Which leads me on to this last little snippet. We often talk in times of environmental change about solutions and what we can we do. Um, when looking at how to enrich our landscape and environment, which seems to be a passion for many people these days, um, an idea to embrace if you want to plant something new is by planting what I refer to sometimes as near natives, such as these three glorious plants often associated with various fantastic brownfield sites in the London area. All of these are na European native species and are less likely to cause invasion problems in the future. And on that note, I've talked about climate change time and time again, both in this lecture and previous lectures. I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was really fascinating. And you, again, you kind of introduced us to a wide range of plants and, and I, I thought it was really helpful to go through the language 
that's used because I think it can be kind of quite misunderstood because you know language is used in a particular way. So really helpful to kind of remind people about of that as well. Um, can I just ask about the mallow, the hybrid you referred to? Yeah. What it was, what's what's the cross between? Because that's when we had the sirens, and I <laughs> so um, I, I'm quite I, sure. I'm, my memory's got a bit fuzzy. I think it's Malvern neglector. I was wondering because it obviously has a bit of the kind yeah. of paler look, and they were they're both particularly common mallow is obviously but you know particularly common but malvern neglector is in quite good numbers so it would you know you can kind of see the potential about it. it is uh both of which are pretty common species they often grow next to each other but the hybrid is extremely rare mm -hmm. i think it's only ever been recorded about three or four times globally um so i was quite chuffed when i found it sadly that plant was destroyed um, okay so often. yeah yeah, but anyway, but, but fascinating to see that. So that's not I hadn't I hadn't actually kind of obviously because it's quite rare. I had not come kind of come across that or heard of that. So I was really interested. It may be more common than we think because mm -hmm. looking for hybrids is a bit of is a niche habitat activity for botanists. But quick tip: if you see a funny looking mallow, have a look lower down the stem, and if it looks if lots of the flowers have aborted and not produced those nice little round cheeses, mm. you've got a good candidate for a hybrid. That's great. So thank you for that. And then I'm going to go to you, Anka, because I think there are a few things kind of come through in the chat. Hi. Yeah. Um, well, there was one question because there was another question about native nettles, but that was actually um, very thoroughly answered by Mario. Um, so Jules was asking, how easy is it to establish whether recent arrivals are introduced by humans or not? Mm. Um, I think some of it is a bit of common sense. So, for example, with some of these Mediterranean wintergreen annuals that we've described and talked about a lot over the years, you quite often find them sitting right next to one of these mature specimen grown olive plants, for example, which have been imported from southern Europe, particularly from central Italy. So you can quite often find them growing out of the soil of the plant it's been imported with. Um, others, you know, it'll be a bit of an inference from geographic origins, you know, something that is an Australasian plant, um, logic, etc., you know, indicates, you know, that it's going to be through the agency of humanity. Uh, when we're looking a bit more deep in time, we do things where like we look at um, pollen profiles historically to see if there's a fossil or subfossil record. But sometimes it's a mystery. Absolutely. Sometimes we're not sure there are still plants which are widely established in parts of Britain um, where we have disputes or disagreements over. Uh, I, for example, disagree with most British botanists about the status of pe pelletry of the wall. I think is a non-native species. It's usually referred to as a native. And the wonderful and beautiful fritillary, um, um, snake's head fritillary, after two or three centuries, two centuries of debate, is now generally accepted as non-native, despite the fact it occurs in a habitat, a quick laid in a few other places, that looks incredibly natural. Thanks. Um, okay, we've got another, well, I think it's a two-part question from JK. Um, sorry, let me move that out of the way. Um, is there a correlation between individual invasive species of plants and insects? For example, is there any evidence of plants and animals coming together? Um, and also, is there evidence of any invasive species having an impact on native insects? So, um... I'm not sure on the correlation thing. That's a very, very interesting question. I don't tend to do much with things with faces, legs and wings. I leave that to other folk. Um, I suspect globally, if you were to look, there probably is evidence of non-native plants being vectors for non-native invertebrates and then being problematic. Um, on the question of whether non-native plants are negatively impacting um, native biodiversity, native invertebrates, I'll come back to Buglia. Um, there's still questions around whether it's been, frankly, because of lack of research, but Buglia appears to be, along with quite a few other very successful um, non-native I mean, invasive species, to be what's referred to as a pollinator captor. 
Um, so invertebrates that are given buglier nectar and pollen first tend to become uh, preferential in their return to that. Um, so there was a study some 15, 20 years ago in Central Europe where researchers um, fed emerging adults of a wide range of European butterfly families, buglia versus several European native, widespread native plants. The ones that had buglia first, when given choices with the other foods from the native, went back to buglia. Now that straight away indicates, you know, that you're actually seeing quite a strong negative impact upon the ecology of those plants. They're going to not be pollinated so much, which is going to affect their populations. That is indirectly going to have a massive negative impact upon other invertebrates that might be associated with those species. We tend to think of invertebrates, you know, just about being pollinators, but plants such as grasses, for example, are immensely important as food for insects and other parts of their life history. Um, and I lost the thread. There was something else I was going to say, but it's gone out of my head. <laughs> um, okay, now that, I mean, the questions are coming thick and fast now, of course. So um, I've been trying to keep up and listen to you at the same time. So um, I'm going to go. Um, so I'll just start from the top, really. Um, which species are most advantaged or disadvantaged by the presence of a railway line? Ah, winds dispersed. Um, um, there's the classic story of Oxford ragwort, which was introduced to Britain from Mount Etna um, in the 16th century um, and hung out in Oxford's walls for a couple of centuries until the arrival of um, the train. Um, and ragworts are wind dispersed and it has moved through the British landscape courtesy of railway lines. It's very, very well documented history. You can even see it on early maps by looking at the lines of the railways and the dispersal. And it is also fair to say similarly buglier, which is also wind dispersed fruit, has massively benefited from the swirl of the railway of, of a train as it moves along. So wind dispersed plants seem to thrive on railway lands, um, but, you know, they tend to be complex and diverse habitats. So, you know, other species can thrive on them as well. And that actually leads us right into the next question. It's very similar. Um, is it known what the effect of passing traffic has on seed distribution? Yeah, which is, is pretty much the same um, thing. Yeah. Yes, we do know, for example, that plants uh, and there's indications that actually probably their reproductive biology is changing in urban environments through shifts in wind speed, not directly through traffic. But there's a thing called crepis sancta from southern Europe, which in urban environments, the species has developed larger, heavier seed so that the plant doesn't blow so far because it doesn't want to go too far away from mummy and daddy because it needs to keep a population structure. So urban environments and wind speeds, whether it be through, you know, building effects on wind, but also vehicles are having profound effect upon the ecology of plants no doubt insects. One of the unfortunate things is that we, you know, we know that urban environments are immensely important for invasive species, they're immensely important for understanding climate change and evolution and adaptation, but globally urban environments are still chronically under-researched and that is most definitely the case in this country. Much of what I talk about in, is really centred upon knowledge and experience and observation. Um, there is a massive need for a, a systematic approach to understanding our city's diverse biodiversity. I just want to pick up maybe one last question and then we're probably going to have to finish off. Uh, okay. on I mean, I'm just, I'm going to um, kind of move to another question because you, um, Mark was talking about kind of lack of, of research in um, urban settings. So um, there was a question here. Um, can any of the plant distributions or assemblages be indicators of air, qual air quality? <laughs> um, possibly. Again, under research, the one that classically is not plants as I can 
So lichens through 300 years, species which we now think of being associated with Western Britain, used to grow in Hampstead Heath. So a group of lichen called Loberia um, and others, Anusnia, used to grow on what is now Hampstead Heath. And um, these ecologically specialized plants, um, I'm, I'm sorry, lichen apologies, um, have been eradicated through the Industrial Revolution era. And because they are dreadful dispersers, they cannot get back um, um, and probably will never will also because the climate is now shifted so much. So lichens are the uh, really you know, the supreme pollution indicators in the kind of vegetable world, so to speak. So that is, again, that's kind of like, we, I'm sure we could kind of expand on that as well. And I can see there, see there was probably a couple of questions we didn't get to, which we might send on to you if you don't mind too much. And we can kind of circulate something around that would be great. So there's been lots of appreciation for the talk and people saying, you know, kind of, the, they love the, de the detail, but also the kind of, kind of really helpful overview that you were giving. So, I mean, you know, lots of, anyway, lots of very nice kind of comments. That have come through so thank you very much to mark but also thank you for people who've kind of contributed to the chat and thank you for people's comments as well and for to mario for answering people's questions that was kind of really helpful too so uh, we're going to wrap I up to say one thing i want to say to everybody who's listening i'd also want to extend my thanks to uh you know kieran anka and um maria for their wonderful support of this um series um I think it's really important for everybody who listens to these things to remember that this is run by volunteers, myself included. The society needs your efforts and activity to support these wonderful people and London's natural history. That's great. And there's always room for more volunteers. So people who are kind of interested in getting involved, there's a whole kind of range of things that you could kind of that you can contribute to the society. So do get in touch. Um, but yeah, that's a helpful reminder. And thank you for the appreciation as well.